Uh, so uh, let's get started. I got a number of things to cover, and I want to I want to try to leave some opportunity and time to have conversations, if you will. Um, what can be confusing is that word lambda, <laughs> right? Uh, so why don't we take a second? Uh, this is a talk on architecture, and we can be. And I do have a couple of goals. There is a thing called lambda architecture, and I do want to cover that, what its purpose is, what what it's all about. Um, but I also want to cover some architectural interest in trying to drive towards Lambda, how to have some agility, if you will, in the data center. And I also want to have a conversation around architecture in general. So where are the things that we can be confused by by the, by the word Lambda? Uh, well, first, Lambdas, in the language kind of thing, a function, right? And that's not a bad concept to have in mind as we talk about the Lambda architecture. That's kind of where the term comes from. Uh, to make things a little bit worse or more challenging is uh, Amazon came out with something called Lambdas. <laughs> uh, that makes life easy, doesn't it? Um, but what is that? Uh, that, uh, you know, the words that come to mind when we talk about Lambda from an Amazon standpoint really is about architecture in one regard. And it is about serverless. You've heard that term, serverless. Doesn't that sound weird? Doesn't it, doesn't it immediately sound wrong? <laughs> right? It was like, I, no, I need a machine. <laughs> you know, uh, to demystify that real quickly, if you're not familiar with it, I think it's worth at least understanding the context of things. What is the context for, that makes lambdas, the, the Amazon lambdas, interesting? Does any, anybody have thoughts on why that might be interesting? There's like a segment, there's a reason that you might choose. Like, I love Venkat's uh, comments uh, in the talk that followed mine earlier today. It was right before lunch. And he talked about kind of abusing or misusing patterns, right? Uh, and I thought that, that it's great to be reminded of that because so, it's so easy to be seduced into that. You're like, oh, uh, you know, this makes sense. And so there, it would be weird that your goal would be to use the lambdas, right? That's a strange thing. But there is a point which you would probably choose that. And if the, no one's going to volunteer an, offer, uh, an answer, the time is when you have, you have a business, you have a need to, add, uh, to provide a service, but uh, your financial incentives or your, the customers that you have are so light or the, or the scale is so low that it just doesn't warrant a full-time dedicated server. If you had such a demand, where I need to have as fast of a response as possible, or I need to have, or the scale of people interested in my service is high enough, I would never choose Lambda. That would, that would make no sense whatsoever. The benefit is getting rid of the cost of a server, right? It's scaling down, which is one of the beautiful things about cloud in general. But I often, th and if there's another purpose, I don't know, I'm open to that. Like if you see another reason why that might be useful, great, let's talk about it. But uh, I, again, I, I, there's like this, uh, there's a new shiny thing and everybody wants to talk about it. Right? And they kind of go in weird directions and they're like, ah, nah, yeah, I'm gonna focus on dedicated hardware or something along those lines. We're gonna talk about something slightly different than that and that's the Lambda architecture itself. To go along that path, I'm also gonna introduce some things. I work for a company called Mesosphere um, yeah, I was the head of research and development for a, a, a small ISP in the U.S. And um, we, thought, we saw three things that were just going to take the world by storm, we thought, right? And this was about three and a half or four years ago. Uh, and I'm really bad with time, but I can tell you, Docker at the time was version 0.3 or 5, somewhere in that neighborhood. So that's, it's that long ago. It was about 2013 is about when that hit. So, uh, and the three things were Docker, Mesos, Apache Mesos, and CoreOS. And uh, I don't know if all those hit, and it's actually kind of weird to look back and go, wow, because <laughs> I'm often wrong, right? But this one actually seems to work out. So, uh, Mesos itself is this kernel, uh, just like a Linux kernel. You have a kernel, most people don't run just a kernel. They run a distribution of a Linux, uh, a Linux distribution. So what that usually includes is a kernel and some useful tools on top of that, like GNU tools. And we find a lot of value in that. So Mesos is kind of this data center uh, layer, this kernel, 
well, there would be value in adding some tools on top of that. And so we've done that. We have they call it DCOS, or Data Center Operating System. Uh, and, a, and it's open source, otherwise I wouldn't talk to you about it. Like I would never bring that up in a, in a setting like this unless you had full access to it. Um, so, uh, so I want to talk a little bit about that as we go, uh, and, and I'll talk much more about that at the last talk of the day. Uh, as an intro into talking about lambdas, because I'm also going to slowly build out a lambda architecture uh, on a data center uh, as we talk. All right. So let's dive into it. The traditional data center. Uh, what does it look like? It's really easy to identify a traditional data center. One of the characteristics is that it's statically partitioned. And frankly, you still have a number of vendors, and, and you always have to be questionable when you have vendors pushing something. There's probably a reason, right? We still have a lot of vendors pushing for this style of architecture. Uh, it, it dominates our industry, for sure. And that's probably in your private data center as well as in the cloud space. Um, so what do we mean by statically partitioned? Well, super simple. Uh, you go to your data center, you have some bare metal, you have some machines, you slice and dice those machines into VMs, but here's how you know you're statically partitioned, right? You say those nine things are for Hadoop, and those 10 things are for Tomcat or some kind of web service thing. Now here, here's an easy way to identify that you are in a statically partitioned world. You treat machines like they're pets. You like you give them names and you take care of them. You're like this one's this is Hadoop one, <laughs> special. <laughs> and what we find the other way you can identify that you're in a statically partitioned world is you're using some kind of provisioning tool. Uh, there's lots of them out there, uh, and it seems to be growing still. But Puppet and Chef stand out. Uh, they're very common. Bosch, if you're in the uh, cloud uh, uh, cloud foundry space, uh, Ansible, Salt. They all you know. Th there's a lot of options. Uh, how do you know that you are in this, this world? Well, because you have pets and they're individualized, you care about great many of them, and you have thousands of chef recipes, thousands of them. That should be your clue. It should, it, it, you know, if we look back on it, we see what happened. Like it, it's, it's natural to kind of grow in maybe a weird direction, right? But eventually you should look back on it and go, is this what I really want? And when you have thousands of recipes, you're like, wait a minute, everything in the data center is a special snowflake. And now, now I have to take care of each one individually, which means I have humans. I, I have to have humans. I need lots of people to manage this, which means I can't automate it. Uh, not completely, right? So that's the world that we're talking about is this. And if I want to grow it out, that means like, uh, that's an overnight activity of let's spin out a bunch more. Um, it's not, it's not something that happens quickly. The other way that you might see this is if you have a mature continuous delivery process, what you would do is when you need to scale something, you have a service, you have some demand, maybe you're getting ready for peak time. When you want to scale up, you are adding capacity and scale at the same time in a cloud environment. I spin an instance of a VM up in order to have more uh, scalability you've added more capacity into the cluster. Those two things are tightly coupled. Uh, in fact, it seems, if you are used to that and that's the world you live in, it even seems odd that it would even bring it up because it's so obvious as to like, it, why, yeah, of course, Ken. It's always that way, all right? So that's the world of a statically partition. Uh, it, it would be something like this. What if you ran a process on your laptop and it asked you this question, which core would you like that to be run on? <laughs> <laughs> this is the first question you have to answer when going into the data center. All right, you want a VM? How many cores do you want? How do you want that managed? Like how, you have to answer all these questions. Now you might have them scripted, but you have to have an answer for them. And it may not be exact, right? What if you kind of want it to be a little bit more dynamic than that? Well, you don't have that option in this world. You actually, it's statically partitioned. You get exactly this and that. Another consequence of a statically partitioned world is, uh, is this lack of elastic sharing. Uh, in fact, I talked a couple hours ago on scalability. What we tend to see in a utility space, if you were to measure it at scale, is you have peak times. You might have different peak times, so this curve might not be exactly right, but there's, there ends up being curves in utility on a machine. Uh, whether you're talking CPU or memory, it depends, and then different applications have different needs. Uh, you have, again, this is living in a VM. This box is a virtual machine. 
and I have a cache in there, and it's pretty steady state. As soon as the cache reaches a certain level of maturity, it's pretty steady state. Uh, you could look at analytics or Hadoop kind of as a, re a reverse curve. Tends to be that you're running analytics uh, at a time that is not during your peak business time. Oftentimes, uh, in a financial institution, it's overnight. It has a certain deadline of being done by a certain time in the morning where you do like a clearing. Notice the wasted space. Uh, let's just Let's just call this memory. It could be any resource, really, but memory seems easy and obvious to talk about. What if we could like bin pack this? What if we could say one machine, take all of those things and bin pack it here? Now, we have some concerns of fault tolerance. We could talk about that. That's a separate concern, really, though, right? Uh, assuming that we're going to multiply these times some number, we have lots of machines to work with. But we could take all three of those and condense it out, down, and now the utility is a little bit managed in a, in a healthier way. In fact, uh, one of the early adopters of Mesos, I can't remember, oh, HubSpot, I think, uh, they decided they wanted to move to Mesos. They were completely EC2, so Amazon. Uh, they went to it for administration reasons. They wanted to be able to have a nice way of uh, managing things. And the consequence of go moving to Apache Mesos on Amazon was a reduction in their Amazon bill by 50%. So they went from 160K a month to 80K a month. Now, where did that come from? Came from all of the things that you see here. We could free up resources, still have some fault tolerances, uh, and, and make better use of the machines that we have, essentially. That's the core of it. OK, so I mentioned uh, DCUS, and I'm going to dive right into Lambdas and start uh, talking about it. Uh, when we talk about Mesos or DCS, the whole concept is we take a bunch of machines uh, and we say, oh, maybe that's one machine. In fact, as a thought experiment, what's the difference between a one node, one, I'm sorry, yeah, a uh, one node that has 100 cores in it versus 10 nodes that have 10 cores in it? Well, the, the real difference, you know, the, first of all, it's the same number of resources, right? If I'm in a cluster that has 10 nodes in it, I obviously can't say this process needs 20 cores. Uh, I would have to say I want two instances of 10 cores or something like that, right? This is, this is some minor differences that you have to manage. But one of the most significant differences is that on a one node machine, I have an operating system. And that operating system has a scheduler. And that scheduler manages the concerns that you don't have to worry about. Like, you never have to go into your, process, uh, yeah, into your machine for a given process and say, I want you to dominate the number of cores, right? Cool thing, I could go into my machine and give uh, a core affinity to a process, at least on a Linux platform I can, uh, which is really cool. But do we usually do that? No, we like the convenience of general compute. There's value to it for other reasons. So I can gain that value on a one-node machine because I have a scheduler that knows how to manage one core machines. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, one node machine, the, the node itself. But I don't have a scheduler to manage multiple nodes until now. That's what, that is what Apache Mesos is. Uh, and then, uh, so the focus is, is we want to be able to program, make programs for data centers just like you would your laptop. The convenience of not figure, needing to answer what core should this run on. Right? Where should this go? I don't want a statically partitioned world. I want much more dynamicism in that process. So it's an open source project. I don't know, this isn't significant. These slides you're going to have, so you can comb through it if you like. Uh, I might skip some of those. The core architecture looks like this. I'm going to have three masters. Uh, well, at a minimum, I'm going to have one. Wow. At a minimum, I'm going to have one. Uh, but in a production environment, you're going to have at least three. Uh, the common uh, infrastructure would normally be either three or five. Uh, and what we need is a quorum. Uh, and, and the numbers are really simple, right? Three, I have quorum. I have the ability to have two machines come to an agreement, and if I have at least two, I can move forward. So it's a way of having an agreement between two machines in a distributed fashion. So why, why five? The, the, the reason why is to have the maximum number of nines, right? I need to be able to, if in a, in a three-node quorum, if I bring down one for maintenance because I'm upgrading opera, uh, software of some sort, I have two, which is exactly what I need for a quorum. I can have a failure, and I've lost the ability to have quorum. With five, I can always do a maintenance upgrade cycle and still have quorum. 
That's, that's the only reason. It's a really simple reason, right? But oftentimes people are missing that, those details. So we have a quorum of zookeepers that are managing essentially leader election and, and service discovery. Uh, Mesos itself is, is just a kernel. It's actually not intelligent. It needs intelligence applied to it. It's called a two-level scheduler. Uh, so we need something that is intelligent that says, hey, I would like you to run Kafka, or I need you to run uh, Cassandra, or something along these lines. We'll talk a little bit more about that as we get into the Lambda space. Uh, in the industry, uh, about a year or two ago, we changed the name of slaves to agents, but the master-slave relationship in computer science has been around for a long time. We just felt like it was a good idea to just get rid of the term completely. We call them agents now. But each one of the, and the beautiful part is if I want to expand this, if I want to add capacity, not scale, if I want to add capacity, I spin up another uh, machine with an agent on it, it automatically adds its resources into the cluster. It's like magic, it's super cool. So this term, sometimes we get a little, it gets a little bit weird that we're calling this a data center operating system. Is it really an operating system? What, what do we mean by operating system? It feels more like a PaaS solution, right? Like a PaaS solution. Uh, here's how we justify it. And it took me a while, by the way, to get used to this as well. When you think about an operating system, there's a number of things that you get with an operating system. One is you get a kernel. We have Mesos. That's the kernel, right? You also get some useful tools, but one of the things you fully expect on an operating system, a, a healthy operating system, is a packaging mechanism. I, I, I need to be able to go app get install blah or yum install, right? That, and, and so there's a structure that manages uh, repositories and a way of installing. All of that should just be magical for me. I, don't, I, need a, I need that convenience. It also has a file system. And it seems a little bit different, but in a distributed operating system, we would have a distributed file system. So either, and it gets, there's more options in this space though, right? Uh, we tend to use a lot of HDFS. It's a popular option, it's a, it's a mature option, it works. A lot of people might use uh, S3 instead. You're on Azure, you might use some blobs in the, in, the, uh, in the Azure space. You could use GlusterFS. There's a number of options, right? Uh, but at some point, you have a distributed file system. So just like you have an operating system in a computer, or in a desktop, in a server, operating system. If you were looking at the Wikipedia definition for operating system, you see the software that manages a computer. We are defining it as managing a data center. It's really, this, we are doing exactly the same thing. That's how we see it. Now it's slightly immature, I hate to even say this, right, because I'm one of the engineers working on it. But it's, it's still immature from an operating st standpoint, right? I don't know, are you guys around when you used Windows 2? Wasn't great, <laughs> but it was still an operating system. You just would rather not, right? So uh, now that said, uh, DCOS at its core is Mesos. And Mesos, uh, when, we, when we get into what does this landscape look like? What are my options, right? Uh, the competitive landscape looks like this. Uh, Apache Mesos and DCOS really are the same thing. It's, uh, again, Mesos is the kernel. DCOS is just some fancy tools on, with the kernel. It's the same thing, roughly. Uh, the com competition in the open source space is Kubernetes. Those are your two choices. What I see is this, and the Kubernetes really is attractive to developers. I can bring it on one machine, disconnect it, I can play with it, I can develop against it. It's very attractive to developers. Uh, but the downside is it, it probably lacks the maturity in the operations space. And I personally do not know of a, a Kubernetes in production as certainly not at high scale. Okay. Now take the flip side, the Apache Mesos or DCOS environment. What does it look like? Well, I can't get it all on one machine and developers get frustrated. And so I don't have the mind share of developers, but it's really amazing in an operational space. And Twitter, which used to fail all the time with the Twitter fail well, completely re-architected their monolithic architecture to use Mesos, and base, we didn't use the term at the time, but a microservice-based architecture. So, and uh, I can't give exact numbers away, I'm not, I don't think I'm allowed to, but take some number times 10,000 nodes, and that's the level of nodes they have in production running uh, in a Mesos space. And then we could add on top of that, PayPal's using it. Netflix just re-architected their entire infrastructure uh, to be on top of Mesos. Uh, PayPal, eBay, uh, we could go through the list. The endless are the number of mature organizations using Mesos in production. 
Airbnb is using it for their analytics, not on the microservice-based architecture. All right. So, DCOS, killer, I don't know. There's a lot of buzzwords in there I don't tend to like. Uh, so, you know, let's take a quick look. Uh, I have, as I pull out, uh, <laughs> I pull out of the oven a baked cluster, right? Uh, it would take too long to start it up. There's a nice UI, that's kind of cool. Um, there's a, we call it the universe. The packages are in the universe. I have a couple things installed here. Why don't we run something? Um, I was gonna prepare for our Lambda architecture, which would include the need to do some analytics. Uh, so I installed uh, Zeppelin. So Zeppelin would be the way that we would start to look and understand the data that's being archived behind the scenes. If I wanted to start a service, I could actually do it right here in the UI, and it seems a little slow. I think it's sluggish uh, based on the Wi-Fi, but let me go in here and say that we, we want to have sleep because I don't know if you noticed, but it's like 3.50 a.m. my body time. So <laughs> sleep sounds like a really great idea. I think I, yeah, there we go. We're going to do a lot of sleeping. Uh, Mesos and say run. Um, now I want to show you one real quick thing. I'm starting an instance of sleep. A, a container is going to just, you know, spin up out there. You can see it's running now. Uh, there's a slight difference. Now, notice something. This becomes important. That could have been an Nginx instance. I, I could have spun up Nginx or Redis, right? We're going to do that in a few seconds, but it could be whatever you want. Sleep is so easy. There's no downloading of stuff. There's no, like, provisioning. It's just, like, run this thing. But notice something super important. I have no idea where that landed. Not a clue. Uh, and, and then it begs the question, well, if you don't know, clearly if you're in production, you could have problems. You could have some challenges. How do I debug this thing? Right? Now, okay, what's the universal tool for debugging in op operations? Tail, right? Like I need to tail something. <laughs> All right, yeah. Yeah, exactly. You guys are there. Uh, what if instead I could go DCOS and say, what are my services? Well, you've got to be able to spell, though. Uh, what are my listing of services? Well, one of the services, and again, this is slower than I was expecting, uh, but it, it'll show the services that are running. We're not going to wait that long, though. Uh, where I wanted to get to is this, though. Uh, I can actually say DCOS service uh, marathon. Uh, Log, oh, no, no, I think it's service log follow marathon. So there's a service that's running called marathon. When I execute this command, by the way, this, the, the commands are running on my laptop. Uh, I am uh, a, I'm a, I'm connected and working with a, 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 a data center or a cluster of nodes that are running in Singapore on Amazon. So the Singapore region and Amazon is what I'm working with, just because it was closer um, in general. When I run this, it will find the service on the node that it is and then stream the log to me on a follow. I don't even have to be there, right? This, these are the kinds of things that we want to be able to do. Uh, and since we're having some performance issues, we may not get through some of those demo things, but it's not a big deal. Uh, I could say, give me a list of tasks, and it would give me a list of tasks. There we go. So I can see sleep is there. Once again, I could also say, hey, uh, you know, task log. Uh, Zeppelin, and I should be able to get uh, an output of log. Now, here's what's really cool. Again, this is going slow enough where I, won't, I probably won't show it. What if I had multiple instances of Zeppelin or maybe multiple instances of sleep? How would we do that? Well, let's come over here, go to sleep, go to sleep. <laughs> Say we want to scale it, and I want three of those. Now, something that's super important about what I just did. Uh, first, I said increase scale. I did not change capacity. No changing in capacity. I have two knobs now. Do I want higher scale or do I need to increase capacity? Those are independent needs now. That's a really big deal, I think. Secondly, uh, of course, now I've got three running. Uh, when I do the log and I say, give me a log output of the thing, let's see if it came back. It didn't. I'll actually see, I can actually do, uh, do a DCOS task of sleep, it's not got a standard out, we, we didn't output something, uh, and say follow, and I will have every task, I'll have three instances that I'm following all at the same time. If I wanted just one of them, I would then be, spe you would specifically say it's ID. 
It would be sleep dot B four E blah blah blah. So I can actually follow a series of them all at the same time. The tooling is uh, absolutely amazing. Okay, uh, why do I bring all this up? For one, uh, I think there's a lot of value in recognizing that we need to be more agile with these, these, this tool set. Uh, and and I, th I really do think that what we've come up with, uh, again, above and beyond Mesos. Mesos is the kernel, does some really cool things. But all the things I just showed you really are DCOS. I want you to stream logs, and I want you to be able to find this node. I want to be able to SSH into the master. All those things are possible with the, essentially the analogy is the GNU tools. And that's about enough of that. It's kind of a nice UI, blah, blah, blah. This is the infrastructure. Uh, we saw a diagram earlier. It's very similar. I have a master of some sort. I do have a CLI and a web interface tied into an admin. Uh, and, and we have private nodes now, which are separate from the public nodes. So all the things that I spun up, when I spun up sleep, it lands in the private space. If I want to expose things, I would then provide a VIP to, uh, and, and some kind of acknowledgment, essentially a label that says, hey, uh, the HA proxy or whatever proxy I'm using here in my public space should route everything to the private node space, which is a normal thing that you would want. Any question about DCUS real quick before I move on to lambdas? You can save it for later if you'd like. But. So let's talk uh, lambda, 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 right? <laughs> uh, the person who laughed, I know what your age is now, so <laughs> there's a neat movie around that. So what is Lambda architecture? The Lambda architecture, what are the, first of all, what's the driver for it? What's the context? The context is the Internet of Things, or IoT. In fact, I, I don't know. What do, why? Why do we come up with these names, these phrases? It's weird to me. It's like Internet of Things, that's the best we can do, right? I tell people I work on the infrastructure of things. That's what I do. <laughs> it's weird. Now, just to bring some context to the conversation, uh, by the way, we had, like, so I work in the Midwest of, of the United States, and we're typically three to five years uh, technically behind the West Coast. And I've actually made a career of that. I've made a career of finding out what the cool kids on the West Coast are doing, uh, learn it, and then I'm the expert when it comes around, right? <laughs> it's actually kind of cool. But now I work remotely in the same place, but I'm, I work for the West Coast, uh, and I'm on the bleeding, bleeding edge, and it's really weird for me. It's, it's a bit of a challenge. It's hard to keep up with, actually. But uh, we had a VC uh, who works in Silicon Valley come into our organization, give us a talk. Uh, it, it's his uh, perception at this point that uh, where everybody now is talking about everything moving to the cloud, and we're starting to see that. There's a high uh, number of organizations moving to the cloud. Uh, what he sees is things moving back out. Isn't that amazing? In Silicon Valley, we're seeing things move out. Why? There's actually a really good reason why. Uh, when we talk about self-driving cars, uh, it's my understanding that self-driving cars create something like two terabytes of data a day. That's one car. If I'm going to process that much information, I have to move the compute out to the car. I have to move it out to the edge. I can't, I can't bring all the data to me. I have to go out to it. You might bring back summaries of data, uh, and highly likely you would, right? But the Internet of Things really is this uh, onslaught of data that we are getting from all these peripheral, uh, peripheral devices that are out there. And I don't know about you, but my home, my, uh, my kids love coming over to my house, right? Uh, so I'm divorced, and the kids come over. I have Alexa. It knows how to start my car. It knows how to lock my doors. It knows how to turn on and off lights. It can, I can say I want to watch uh, Netflix, and it knows to turn on the right devices. It's awesome. Actually, it was one time, uh, it was a little bit weird for me. I came to the realization, I think I had it for like two or three weeks, and I realized, Amazon knows way too much about me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a little concerned about what that's going to be like, but... Uh, so, so that's the world, the Internet of Things. I don't know if you've seen this because the news was in the U.S., but it was fascinating to me. It was maybe three years ago. I'm off. I might be off on timing of things. Two or three years ago, I think, though, uh, a father was very upset with Target. And he was upset because they kept sending his 16-year-old daughter uh, information about prenatal care and about baby care and things like that. And, uh, and he was really mad because it seemed weird. 
And then they discovered that based on buying habits, Target knew before the father knew that his daughter was pregnant. <laughs> Crazy. That's the world that we're living in, right? Uh, so that's, that's where we see data going, and that all happens based on this. Now, uh, Lambda architecture really is an enabler of that, and we've actually been using this style or technique for a very long time, so let's dig into it. The core of it is the, it's all about data. Uh, when we talk Lambda architecture, it's truly about data and looking at data. So the architecture really is these three layers, if you want to call them that. The batch layer, or the speed layer, and the serving layer. So at some point, you want to serve up an answer. A human needs to know. You need to be able to evaluate it, see reports, things of that nature. Uh, and, and let's demystify it right away. What, what have we been doing that's very similar to this for a very long time? Well, that would be uh, indexing pages on the web. When you're indexing a page, you, you discover a new page as you're crawling the web, and you're like, i got to give this an index. It's got to fit into my model somewhere. And I have a couple of different needs. One need is that I, I need an answer now. I need, I need to be able to um, have this as an option right now. Another uh, need might be, I really need this answer to be accurate. And so it's for a very long time we've been doing this. I will actually have a very quick answer, and it's good enough. And overnight or over some process, I'll have a very accurate answer. And then I'll update the index to the accurate answer. And one could almost call that eventual consisting, but it's not, it's not really the same thing. I have eventually a better answer, right? Um, so that's the architecture we're going to talk about. In the batch world, we're managing some data set. Um, Oftentimes in this space, when things are inbound, it's really immutable data. You, there's never a reason to change that data. So we also look at this data in slightly different ways, right? And in fact, in this world, uh, as you start to dive into this world, it's very common that the world we used to be in used to be like relational data stores. And in that world, what you cared about is saving memory and space. And that I only wanted an answer, I only wanted it once. I want an instance of that, and it's exactly once. And that's broken, right? Like, if you're going to, one, if you're going to scale, you have to change that. And two, if you have this volume of data, I'm going to specialize that data. And so I commonly write things multiple times uh, for different needs. So I take the hit on the right. Now, I have a couple of different competing needs. One is I have an onslaught of data coming in. I have streams of data coming in. So my first need is to respond to that. I need to be able to write that. In fact, let me ask you an architectural question then. What is the fastest way to write data to disk? Fastest way to write data to disk? I just, what's that? Encryption? Yeah, so, so I have a pointer on the disk, and I just keep writing. In other words, I keep appending, right? Constant appending. I don't care about, I, in other words, I'm not looking at the data. I'm not processing the data. I'm not analyzing the data. I just keep writing data. Right? And at that point, I can provide some disconnect. I can go, well, something's going to read that data at some point. Frankly, if you never read data, there's no value in writing data. Right? Is everybody cool with that? <laughs> so, uh, but I have a quick disconnect for that. Now, uh, now I have another problem. If I, if I have the need to write data, I think the quote, I'm going to misquote it. I think the quote is, scaling reads is really, really hard, and scaling writes is impossible. Right? <laughs> How do we manage the scaling of writes? Well, that means I need multiple things writing at the same time. And how do I, how do I separate that out to make sure that we get the right thing going on, right? Um, we'll talk about some tooling in a second that brings that to light. In the batch, we have immutable data coming in, and we're going to batch that. We have a serving where we're going to serve up these queries, uh, and then we have the speed layer. Um, and we're going to see how this all fits together in just a second. So where does the Lambda architecture fit in? I'm trying to bring all, all this together. When we talked about indexing pages, I talked about two different paths. I talked about the fact that I need a quick answer and I need an accurate answer. That is exactly what we do in the Lambda architecture. I have two functions, hence Lambda. I have two functions that break out. One goes the fast way, one goes the slow way. And here's what, you, here's what you're going to be fighting. You're going to be, I don't know if I like that, Ken. Okay, take a breath. You might have duplicate code. <laughs> I know. It, 
You, you might have different technologies that are in the fast lane versus the slow lane. You may decide to write similar functions, or maybe even the exact functions in two different languages. Might happen. And you'll have to and there might be a benefit to that. There is a simplification, which I know less about. Somebody in the speaker lounge was asking me just before lunch. And uh, I was like, yeah, I used to talk about that, but I haven't looked at it forever. There's a simplification of the Lambda architecture called the Kappa architecture. And the Kappa architecture really is, in essence, to reduce duplication. But again, there, there is a, it's a careful balance there. Like, is the effort to try to maintain you know, uh, less redundancy, is it worth it if, you, if it costs you something as far as the ability to respond, things like that. So we're going to see this a number of times. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll show different components fitting into each one of those things. The focus of the Lambda architecture is around fault tolerance and basically managing uh, an onslaught or a stream of data in a, a, and being able to handle low, qu uh, low latency queries. Now it's going to vary uh, as we start throwing products in here and understanding how they fit. Uh, I'm going to show an example just because I think showing a concrete example clarifies things. But I don't want you to take this as the defining architecture or the, the recipe, right? It, it, it is an example of a recipe. There may be variations of it that you may choose to do and with good reason. Um, and that might be one of the questions you decide to bring up a little bit later. Uh, I'm going to bypass this. Um, so our focus, this is a map bar diagram. This is how they see the world. I have streams of data coming in, and I want you to start thinking streaming. What are we using? What do we use for streaming? How do I manage streams? I have different uh, real-time views of the world, and I have batch views of the world. And then I ha maybe I have some ability to, to merge that together. That varies uh, very strongly. And the organizations that I've been at where we have Lambda architectures, you don't always have this. Oftentimes, you have just two different views of the world. So let's start throwing in components and talking about them. When we're talking streaming, the first thing that should come to mind probably in today's world is Kafka. And uh, I will talk in more detail on each one of these subjects, uh, but Kafka just stands out. It's usually your front end. Data's coming in, and you're just logging stuff. Oh, you know what? That's an interesting question. For, for every database, so everything that you use to store data, what is the source of truth? What's that? The log. Yeah. The, the question becomes, let's say your database becomes corrupt or it fails and you need to reconstitute state. You always go to the transaction log, right, to, to pull in and recon The source of truth has always been the log in the first place. So the question is, is, well, if it's the source of truth, what if we just had a different way of accessing it? What if we just made it accessible with a service? Well, we call that Kafka, right? It's, it's a really interesting thing when you think about it. Uh, I'll have a blog post for you to read. It's a lengthy one of the creator of uh, Kafka, and I think it's well worth reading. Okay, so uh, going down this path, you're going to have some kind of streaming tooling. Uh, this is the fast stuff, right? We're going to batch. Uh, we're going to change how we look at data. It's not transactional. It's streaming. Uh, there are two core tools that I am most familiar with, and one is Storm, and the other one is uh, Spark. Uh, there is a growing number of things in that space, and I've lost track of all of them. So if there's, your favorite is not on the list, then that's, that's, that doesn't mean don't look at it. It just means I'm not as familiar with it, okay? But they all have the same kind of function. I'm streaming data, and I, want, I may want to process data as I'm streaming it. That varies. Um, a, a, a quick note on Storm, though. Storm, uh, the one thing I know about Storm is this. It also needs a zookeeper to manage certain things. And uh, it, Zookeeper has a number of features or functions. If you're not familiar with Zookeeper, its defined function is a distributed coordinator. That's, that's its core function. But what it really does is it provides the ability to have, uh, oftentimes used for leadership election. Uh, it has ephemeral nodes, and when the node goes away, I can then take over. Kind of, essentially, uh, like what you would have a monitor in a process for, like you would actually synchronize and have a monitor lock within a process for threads. Think of uh, one of the features of Zookeeper is doing that out of process. I have multiple uh, processes that need to lock on something, and we would use Zookeeper for that capability. 
But the other thing that Zookeeper does is it can store a little bit of data. And it's intended for like configuration data. And it stores things as a key value pair. So if you were thinking key value pair store, you might think Cassandra or Big Table or something along those lines, right? Um, and you certainly, hopefully, don't think Zookeeper. But since I have to tie to Zookeeper anyway, uh, whoever the authors were of Storm said, well, well we're just going to store some data in there. Not a big deal. Zo uh, uh, Storm abuses Zookeeper. Uh, if you are going to use Storm, the one thing that I would recommend is have its own Zookeeper separate from other Zookeepers in your infrastructure. All right? It's very abusive to Zookeeper. Otherwise, uh, I don't have any negative things to say outside of that, it's, but just be aware of that. That's a consequence that you want to be aware of. By the way, uh, within Twitter, when they moved to the new architecture on Mesos, they had a couple of either outages or close calls. All of them, to my understanding, were Zookeeper related which is an interesting thing to note. Uh, it's, a, it's the linchpin of the data center, right? <laughs> like if it falls, bad things happen. <laughs> so just be aware of that. Um, okay, uh, I'm gonna drive into a number of other specific components in that space. Let's talk batch. Uh, the, each one of those three categories, we're gonna talk through some tooling. One of those is the batch components. Hadoop is the kingpin in that space, right? It's, it's already in a large number of organizations. It's already used for MapReduce. It does a great job. Uh, if you're looking for something more modern, something with fresher bits, as I like to hear Venkat say, these, bet, these bits are fresh. That means they're better, right? <laughs> they're youthful bits. Um, that would be Spark. Now, Spark is also known to be faster, but it's largely because it does things in memory. Um, and then you can see a number of other uh, tooling on that. Those two are kind of the, the, the ones to think about. Hadoop and Spark. In the, in the serving component, uh, storing data, it, it depends on which organization you're working with is what they choose. I would say in all the ones that I've worked with, they use Cassandra. And Cassandra really stands out. Uh, I don't remember now. Uh, Facebook uses uh, one of these two down here. Uh, but uh, Volt, uh, DB, and Druid, they're very popular. Influx I'm hearing a lot more about. So obviously that's on the up uprise in, uh, to a certain extent. Uh, I've never seen an impl uh, implementation of Elephant, so I don't know about that. Cassandra really stands out for the companies I work with. In the speed layer, we're commonly using Storm or Spark Streaming. You can see a couple of other options up there. Uh, I, I commonly use and probably predominantly use Kafka and Spark Streaming together. Okay, that seems to be the common place where I'm at. Oh, I mentioned Kafka, uh, I'm sorry, the Kappa architecture already a little bit. Okay, so let's start uh, looking at this a number of different ways. Uh, let's dive into this. This is the data flow diagram at in, uh, InLink, the guys who created Kafka. This was the problem they were trying to solve. Have you seen a diagram similar to this in your organizations, <laughs> right? Like, oh yeah, I need that data over here as well. Oh yeah, do I, do, I, do I duplicate that data into my store or do I make a call out to a service? These are the concerns that I have as I start to lay out this diagram. Uh, but we run into some serious consistency issues, data consistency. Uh, and this is you know, the end result of where things went is, well, let's have everything go to the source of truth, which is Kafka. And uh, if you heard me earlier talking a little bit about Kafka, it's a little bit weird. Uh, it's described as a pub sub, and it kind of has a, a pub sub interface, and, but you can't really compare it to any other Java, JMS pub sub. It is just so strongly different. So this is one of those exceptions. Like I like to categorize things, but uh, I initially categorized this because it's pub sub as, as similar to the others, but it's so strongly different that that's wrong, right? That is not correct. What you tend to be interested in with Kafka is data retention. And frankly, there's some organizations that um, they almost use Kafka as their data store and data retention is near forever. So, and that's a little bit weird for some, right? So you have to decide how you wanna leverage that. But uh, this is the diagram for which we normally target uh, within the company I work for. In fact, we used to call it the smack stack. I don't know if you saw the order on my agenda, but you have um, Spark, Mesos, uh, Aka, 
Cassandra and Kafka, smack, right? Uh, marketing, for some reason, didn't like it. <laughs> we don't use that term. So uh, we have inbound streaming. We have the Kafka uh, cluster. We're storing things to disk. From that point, we'll stream them through Spark uh, into a Cassandra ring. This is where we start to have some strong differences in different organizations. Sometimes it's one Cassandra ring, and you're reading and writing to it for multiple, dif you know, for different purposes and to different tables. Sometimes they actually are two different rings. Uh, where you commonly have two different rings is this ring may be, you know, one data center and managed uh, locally, where this is multi DC and takes on the extra overhead of distributing data across multiple data centers, which Cassandra is capable of. Also, you could throw in the other pieces that are kind of missing up here. You still commonly have like an HDFS and maybe a Hadoop or a Spark. So that's what you're using for analytics, storing checkpoints within HDFS or blobs of data of some sort as you're processing. There's the SMAC stack as I was talking about it earlier. Let's dive into each one of those and talk just a little bit about it. Kafka, the focus is just streaming data, as, a, as I was mentioning, just moving a pointer. The bare minimum amount of what is necessary to take data and move it to disk. Of course, it does more than that. It does that with uh, you determining how much redundancy you want on that. So there's multiple nodes writing the same data uh, and, and, and how fast you want it, so to speak, which means what, as data is streaming in, I will disseminate that data across multiple nodes uh, where one will write one and, one and the second one will write another. Uh, so in one case you're duplicating and others you're distributing the workload, if you will. And oftentimes you're doing both. So it's a little complicated in that, in that way, but that's what it's used for. It's high throughput, low latency messaging or really logging. Uh, we've already seen the diagram that that, that represents. Uh, you can have multiple inbound sources, and you can have, uh, and what's more common is that you have, yeah, I've seen installations in both cases, but it's very common to have one source of truth coming in, like a stream, an onslaught of data coming in, uh, with multiple clients reading uh, for their purposes. And the beautiful part, then, is you're reading, a, there's two real cool benefits to this. If you had a failure, um, and you have an idempotent, architecture, I, I should take a step back. What is idempotent? Well, first of all, idempotent means that uh, uh, if you have an event that occurred and that event, it, it, and you had a state change, if you had that event replayed, you would have the exact same state. That's the core of it, right? But it turns out that that is really hard to do and we're actually not used to it. So let me give you an example of what's not idempotent to make things clearer. You go to the data store, imagine a relational data store, and you say, delete this row. Delete a row where the ID equals one. And it'll say, okay. And then you're like, did it work? Let's do it again. Delete a row where the ID equals one. And that row doesn't exist. That is a different experience. <laughs> and that is not idempotent. Um, we want the same exact behavior every time. And the benefit of an idempotent architecture is that if I were to fail and I don't know if I succeeded or not, I can go back and replay everything and I should be in the exact same state as if I did not fail. You can, it, I think the benefits are clear. The ability to write that is actually really hard. And, and, and which is surprising a little bit because restful endpoints uh, by design are supposed to be idempotent. So we're supposed to be, but we're not exactly great at that. Okay, so uh, the point was, is if I have a failure that happens in reading Kafka, I can always go back to the pointer and say, okay, now go back and start reading from yesterday's log and read until you get to today. So there's some really great fault tolerance that we can build into there. Um, I can have different clients or cus uh, consumers with different needs, varying needs. So I have different read pointers that are going on at the same time. A lot of really cool things we can do with, with Kafka. Um, and essentially, it's just an ordered log. That's it. It's just a pen to pen to pen. It's just a huge ordered log. All right. So, and then we have different partitions for writing uh, high scale writes across multiple machines, uh, which we define as a topic. So, and there's some guarantees. 
Um, okay, so there's a must read I mentioned, uh, and I, I, he I hesitate to just give you a link because that doesn't look oppressive on a slide, but I assume that you're going to actually look at these slides uh, later, and you'll have them. Uh, but this is a must read for all engineers, in my opinion. It is really looking at the, the, the role of logs within a distributed architecture. And it essentially is that it never says the word Kafka. I don't remember it saying the word Kafka. But it is the defining reason why Kafka exists, essentially. It's also very long. I remember, I think I printed it out in PDF so I could read it on a plane ride. And I think it's like 52 pages or something. It's long. So it's not your standard blog post. <laughs> Akka. I have a little bit less to say about Akka, but essentially it's uh, for managing uh, 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 computational power across the cluster, essentially. It's, it farms out jobs. It's probably most, most well known in the Scala space. Uh, you, you do have the ability to integrate with it in the Java space. Um, and it's not a core component, actually, of Lambdas, but it's very common to see in highly distributed environments, so I bring it up. Spark, uh, I'm not going to go into heavy detail here, but Spark was the first framework that was ever used, that was ever uh, created for Mesos. Uh, in fact, when Mesos was first created, uh, it, it's not intelligent. It doesn't know what to schedule. We had to create something as a two-level scheduler. We had to create something that would actually have some intelligence. That was Spark. Came out of the UC, uh, UC Berkeley out of the AMP lab and was the first scheduler for Mesos. And that's taken on a life of its own. Uh, and, and it's grown up quite a bit. Uh, in every implementation that I've seen of Spark, I've seen it uh, on Hadoop, or as part of the Yarn. I've seen it on Mesos. I've seen it in standalone, but standalone is not production, right? That people trying it out. In a production world, it's always been on one of these two platforms. And almost always, I also see an HDFS environment involved, where I'm actually storing uh, snapshots of data or playing with data of some sort. Uh, and then we have a number of different options that we can use with Spark. Spark SQL, absolutely amazing. It gives you the, what, what, if you're not familiar with Spark, one of the great things that it does is it brings in data from disparate systems. Uh, I, I can bring things in from a file system. I can bring things in from Cassandra. You can bring it in from lots of different sources, and it all takes on this data format called RDD. Once I'm in that data format, I can play with this data with like a SQL. I can do joins and stuff with this data that came from completely different data stores, which is really cool. The other thing to know is that I don't have a SQL. I have a CQL in Cassandra, but I don't have a joining capability within Cassandra. And sometimes you, you need it kind of after the fact. And the best way to manage that is to have Spark read in things out of Cassandra and then in memory do those joins for you and then provide you back an answer. So that's the reason why Datastax, which is the company behind Cassandra, is so to uh, closely tied to Spark. That is prob they probably do more Spark training than Cassandra training uh, today, which is interesting. But it's largely because as you get to building uh, later on in the life of Cassandra, you often need to be able to do joins. You can't, and so you need uh, Spark to do that. Uh, but we can go further. As we saw in the Kafka architecture, I'm going to have Spark streaming. And I think I have a slide on that to kind of, if that's new to you, to talk about that. Uh, again, here's the stack. Here's the streaming component of it. Uh, in fact, the next slide probably helps us out a lot uh, better. When you're looking at transactions, you're usually, uh, when you, a normal architecture, you're looking at transactions. And you're invoked, you're invoked, you're invoked. But you could have, I don't know, uh, thousands of transactions a second. And, oh, and, and then at a later point, you have 100 transactions a second. And what you get is kind of inconsistent management of time or, or resources in that world. So the question becomes, could I slice things differently to have more consistency. And so instead of slicing things by transactions, we can slice them by time. So I can say, and we call them micro batches, right? So I'm going to micro batch something. And you, can, you can imagine that a micro batch is maybe a half a second or a quarter of a second. And then I don't know how many transactions are in that. It might vary over time. But, uh, but, it, but, but I'll, I will always have a processing that happens every half a second. And now it's very consistent, right? Especially if all I'm doing is logging things at that point. Um, so that's the whole point. I have a thing. Here's our DDD again. Everything in Spark is DDD. 
I have a micro batch. Each thing is a map of a, of a time, essentially, and it becomes the D stream that's coming in. Uh, there's some code. Can't ever have a talk without code. I did that last hour. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Uh, but the core of it is uh, working with Spark. Uh, it's fairly simple. Uh, I just create a streaming context. And, and from that point on, it's, it's relatively just like working with Spark in general. Uh, this is defining the, uh, the timing window. So I have some unit of a window and a sliding window that I have that actually controls the streaming of data. And notice I'm saving it in to, directly into Cassandra. So there's a nice tie as, we've, uh, as Datastax has worked so closely with Spark of course, they own pretty much the code base for Cassandra. We actually have a method to save things directly to Cassandra. Uh, you do have the ability to save to other data stores, by the way. So don't, don't, don't consider this to be um, the only option. But uh, it's such a common option that we have some conveniences there. Uh, I'm running out of time, but let's talk about Cassandra real quickly. Uh, you know, with Cassandra, the reason why it seems to be so popular is you can't see a Cassandra talk without the Netflix linear graph. <laughs> and uh, so there's close to linear scalability that you can get at high orders of scale uh, within Cassandra. Uh, it's a key value pair store, if you're not familiar with that. Uh, and, you know, we, it's a simple thing to install. I can't do the demo here, but literally, here's the cool part. For most data centers, if you're going to install for the very first time Cassandra, uh, oftentimes there's like a planning period. There's like getting a consultant in. By the time you actually have it running in a production environment, it's a half a day, a day away, or, or, or more, right? Uh, literally, DCOS package install Cassandra. Within five minutes or 10 minutes, uh, you have a Cassandra ring that has started. If you go with the defaults, you get three data nodes, uh, but you can control that. You can completely change it. Uh, yeah, you have some limits on what you can control. They're defined as uh, part of the packaging, uh, but that's evolving over time as well. And the beautiful part is there is a health check that's built in that's known from the UI or from the uh, uh, CLI. And the health check guarantees that, I, that uh, the health check literally does a CQL on Cassandra. So it means that I can talk to Cassandra in its defined query language. And if that doesn't happen, then it's not healthy. So it's a really awesome uh, utility on top of DCUS. That's why I brought it up, in fact, uh, to be able to install that. And all the, I, I used to do the demo again of doing this whole Lambda. As I got to Spark, I would install Spark. As I got here to Cassandra, I would install Cassandra. And then we would see a stream of tweets coming in to the data store, and then we'd do queries against that in Zeppelin. So um, I'll show you at the end of the presentation uh, where you might be able to get that demo because it's open source and you can play with it if you'd like. And that's it. You know what? Most of this is just example slides of Cassandra. We have uh, just a few minutes. Let me open it up to some questions and thoughts. Um, anyone have some thoughts or questions about architecture in general or lambdas or use cases or why my hair is red? Or why it's so hot in here? I don't know. Yes? You said that we get a partial data, then it gives me a much more detailed data. Yeah. Could you give me an example on that? Yeah, the simple example, so the question was geared around like uh, having intermittent data and, and when do I see value in this, I guess. I mean, I'm, I'm kind of paraphrasing a bit. Uh, the easiest one that we're all familiar with is the accuracy of a page index as we're you know, combing through things. Uh, when we get, you know, uh, and, and then good examples are really case sensitive. Uh, but, you know, as the example of uh, Target or something like Target, you have a stream of data coming in of sales. And I might, it's, it's unclear as how you might identify a person. You might identify them by their credit card number. You might identify them by a variety of ways, right? A lot of times pe humans will volunteer their information. Uh, based on that, though, I can see what they've, what they've ordered. When I first stream in, I don't really know what I'm looking for necessarily. I might have a goal in mind, but I'm just streaming in data. It's just being saved. I later on may have a, a batch need to go through and pull all the data for a given credit card or for a given human and start to abstract a number of things. Most commonly, I will take that data that I just gathered and write again. So I'm writing uh, the the answer 
of what my theory was around the MapReduce process. Does that make sense? Um,